to the uh, little uh, mini lesson on economic principles. Now, one of my philosophies when I teach history classes is that I want you to um, get more than just the specific facts that you're going to learn about, but also like broad lessons to apply to lots of history. Because what's the point of studying history unless you can see the bigger picture? So today we're going to talk about the five economic principles, um, which is a useful lens to understand in a lot of history why people do what they do um, and what are the um, guiding principles like um, and of such. So to start our talk, though, we need to understand first what is economics? Um, and so what does that mean when we say, well, you know, economics? So economics is um, the study of how a person or a group of people choose to allocate their resources. So, you know, you have a certain number of things. How are you going to allocate them? Now, the group can be an individual. It could be a city. It could be a company. Um, really an entire country, it just depends on what you're studying and the size. Um, so in, for example, in the period we're studying, early modern world history, um, the early economic units were the city-states of Italy, um, which was like Florence or Venice, or you had the entire Chinese empire, which was also um, rather big. So either way. Now, um, this can be a useful lens for understanding why people made some of their historical choices. So like why did Columbus choose to sail west to go east? Why did Europeans end up adopting slavery? Um, and um, many things. Why did the Chinese empire stop doing voyages of exploration? All of those things. Um, and it doesn't explain everybody's behavior, but it can sure explain a lot of what we do and why we do it. Um, so to start with, there are going to be five broad principles that we're going to um, review. And they all interact to create economic decisions, ultimately. So principle number one, scarcity and choices. So what does that mean? Well, resources are by their definition limited, okay? And so a resource can be a physical good. It could be um, uh, money. It could be an intangible like time. Really, um, resources can it just vary. But by their definition, we don't have unlimited anything. And so that is our scarcity. And because we don't have that unlimited supply, this scarcity of resources, it forces us to make choices. We have to make the choices that we make. So the example I would use for myself is, why am I teaching an online class at DVC? And the reason is, is because there were a couple of scarcities. One is I teach during the day. Um, so my scarcity of time limits me from doing a uh, you know two or three time a week class at DVC. The other scarcity that comes up is um, I taught a night class um, at DVC, but there weren't enough students because the student uh, students in the San Ramon um, DVC area don't come for night classes. So therefore, there was a scarcity of that, so they stopped offering the in-person night classes. So therefore, my scarcity and the student scarcity has forced me to make the choice to be here. Um, and there you go. Um, so that is how um, scarcity can work. You, I imagine, in your own lives, why are you taking an online class? So you might have a scarcity of time. It might be the distance getting to and from, um, you know, those are all choices that we all make. And you see those historically. 
such as Christopher Columbus choosing to go west because the Portuguese had locked up the routes going east, so that certainly mattered, or the fact that they adopted slavery as a way of solving the labor shortage because there was a scarcity of labor. So all of those things um, interact for that. Okay, so principle number two is the idea that our choices um, impose costs and benefits and we receive benefits and incur costs. And any economic choice we make, um, we have to weigh those benefits against the cost. So when we decide which choices to make, that's what we're doing. So choosing to take this class online, okay, perhaps has benefits for you, like you can do it at any point during the week, but it might have costs, like you, you, you lose the face-to-face -face interactions with the teacher, um, and you decide what might work better for you. Um, now, the way you, that you value what, how you measure the cost of a choice is you measure the value of what you gave up. So if instead of taking this online class, you could work and make you know, a couple, few, a few thousand dollars, then you, that's the value of that. And that is called opportunity cost. Now, sometimes the costs are not always directly money. It can be time. It can be some other resource, which we then assign a monetary value to. Um, but again, it's what is, you know, what are the costs, what are the benefits, and we all weigh them all the time. Now, um, principle number three is that people respond to incentives in particular ways. And if you want to affect people's behavior, you can change the incentives. Um, now, an incentive can come in two varieties. They can be positive or they could be negative. So a positive incentive is something like you complete your assignments well and you get a good grade in this class. Or a negative incentive could be, well, if you do it poorly in a purple crayon and don't use verbs, well, you're going to then suffer a penalty. Um, and so the size of the incentive can change the, or the severity can change people's actions. So for example, if uh, I tax gas higher, I'm trying to affect people's behavior that they will then um, you know, buy more fuel efficient cars or use less gas. Or if you steal, you are more likely to go to prison. Um, and so again, that's a negative incentive. And so we as a society do incentives all the time. The current debate about immigration at the border, a lot of what President Trump's tactics are doing is to take away the incentives of people coming to America by either making it you know, harder, more dangerous, um, or less likely to succeed, and then people you know, coming from their countries will make different judgments. Um, and that is you know, how incentives work. Um, but they don't always work in the way we think. Sometimes you know, an incentive can have unintended consequences, which takes us to principle four, that sometimes our choices have large unintended consequences that we don't necessarily realize. Um, and sometimes um, they're good and sometimes they're bad. And sometimes these consequences can show up for us right away. Um, but other times we might have to wait decades or centuries to see the full impact. So for example, Columbus was the first person to sail to the Caribbean and South America, uh, first European. But he brought diseases with him and that was an unintended consequence. And within a hundred years, the population that had been there in 1492 was now you know, 90% of it was gone. Um, so that was and definitely an unintended consequence. Now, an intended consequence might have been, well, he was trying to get rich um, and help Spain, which he did, but again, in a way, since they were new continents. Another example of unintended consequence are the humble potato which was brought from the New World to Europe, but potatoes are much more efficient as a crop. They can grow just about anywhere, provide much more of the nutrients per acre of, that you grow, and that revolutionized the European diet and 
um, led to um, it led to um, people um, a population boom in Europe, and so that um, uh, definitely impacted European history in a way that was unintended. Um, another good example is slavery um, in America, where we chose to, because of our scarcity of labor, to you know, import Africans to be enslaved people, and that eventually leads to the Civil War and shapes American history in many fundamental ways. Now, last principle that affects things is um, institutions matter. Now, institutions, um, this is a hard one to sometimes get your head around. Institutions are things that help enforce the rules of the game. Another way to think of it is it's the rule of law. And if you have rule of law and strong institutions, that helps your economy be strong. Now, institutions can be things like laws, customs, morals, superstitions, our cultural values. And um, without these institutions, people are uncertain that they will keep the benefits that they're going to get out of their choices. Um, and so all of that makes a big difference. Um, so, an example of an institution mattering is this. This is an example of um, an institution. So the coin uh, you see here, this is a florin from Renaissance Florence around 1450. Now why does this little coin matter? And It's not actually all that big. Um, the reason it mattered was because Florence was, had a banking system and was the strongest economy at the time. And because people understood that this florin would have a certain amount of gold, that that amount of gold would be consistent, it would make a big difference and it would be valuable and they could trade it. So the banking system of Florence really fueled the Renaissance, which then helped fund a lot of the explorers and led to all kinds of things in Europe. But it starts with the strong institution of a banking system and knowing that if you loaned money, your money would be secure. Now, another example of an institution you can see here, these are replicas of some Roman coins. And the Roman Empire is a classic case of having strong institutions to help your economy. And then as those institutions fade. So the Roman coin um, started with their lowest coin was a sesterce, going all the way up to the gold coin, um, you can see at the bottom there, the denarius. Now, the, in the early Roman Republican Empire, they had more than enough uh, precious metals to make these coins. So what you saw was what you get. But as the Roman Empire um, grew and had challenges, they began to um, debase the coinage, it's called, where they would take two denarius and make four coins out of it, lowering the gold content. And when an economy prints more money, that ultimately becomes a problem because then um, it leads to inflation because everybody has more money around. You'll see the same challenge with the New World, um, if you've already read the chapter or if you do, about Potosi, where the silver that the Spanish mined flooded the economy of Europe and led to all kinds of problems and challenges. Now, here's another example of an institution. This is a quarter sheet of US $1 bills that I happen to have hanging on the wall in my classroom. Now, if you think about it, why is that little green piece of paper worth something? It's just a picture of George Washington. It has a number on it. There's nothing really magical about the paper. It's a little thicker than normal. But what gives it value? Well, what really gives it value is that we decide that it has value. Because I know that I can, you could take that sheet off my wall, cut it into its 32 pieces. It actually cost me $50 to buy the 32 pieces. Um, you can talk to the US government about that. But why, why does it have value? Because you have confidence that you can take that and buy something with it. If you give it to somebody, they will give you something back. 
And those people have confidence in that. That's why they'll take it. So that's an example, again, of institutions because the U.S. government is strong. So if you travel around the world, I was just came back from Vietnam and Cambodia, and they will take American dollars there because they have more confidence in that currency than they do um, in their own currencies. Okay, now here's an, a kind of a novelty thing, but again, what makes these matter or not matter? So those pieces of paper you see behind you, those are the same size as the previous $1 bills, yet they're not worth anything, although I wish they were. So I cannot take my million dollar bill and buy myself a nice house in the Bay Area, or given some of our prices, maybe half a house. Um, it's nobody's going to accept it because nobody has confidence that it's worth anything. And the bill below was from uh, President Obama's 2008 campaign. Nobody's gonna give me $8 worth of stuff for that. Because again, we don't have confidence that it has any value. Now here, you can see an example of where inflation really matters. So what you see on these uh, dollar bills is these are from the country of Zimbabwe. Now, around 2007, Zimbabwe, um, the country had had a lot of debt, so they began printing more and more money. And you can see what happened. So in 2007, $50 might buy you something in Zimbabwe or $20. Okay. But by 2008, because the government began printing so much money, a $200,000 note, then you have a $10 million note, and by the end of 2008, $50 billion. So why am I teaching this online class when I have a $50 billion bill? Well, because I got the entire set of all that currency for $6 in Zimbabwe. So, because it is not worth anything because the government will no longer accept it, nor will the people in Zimbabwe. Um, so, that more or less is your economic principles and how they work. And as you study anything we're going to do in this course, keep that in mind. How did the economic principles shape people's behavior? And in our first unit, certainly,